Chances are, if you've been browsing to buy a mechanical watch, you've probably come across the term in-house movement. It has become a prized classification for watch manufacturers as it sends a message of mastery of their craft. However, is this actually the case or is this just an overblown exercise of marketing? In this video, I want to unpack the idea around in-house movements, discuss what they are, their origins, the common gray areas, and the general pros and cons associated with them. Before we get too far into dissecting the idea of in-house movements, let's establish a base definition most would agree with as a starting point for our video. An in-house movement is a watch movement that is designed and developed by a manufacturer within one of their own facilities. To begin the story around in-house movements, it's important to address at the onset that the term in-house has only been in circulation for the past two decades to a prominent degree. Even in the 1990s, brands were not heavily positioning products by whether their movements were made internally within their own facilities or by third-party manufacturers. This was essentially the case for all levels of watchmaking, even among the most prestigious brands such as Patek who used Lamania-based calibers for decades, or with AP and Vacheron using movements provided by JLC in some of their watches. But despite it being difficult to identify the first brand that adopted this phrasing, it appears that it was spurred on by a few factors. First, with a desire to strengthen market position. With the shift of how consumers were seeing watches with the rise of quartz-powered timepieces and the rise of portable consumer electronics like phones, brands needed to lean into their mastery of the craft even more, and rightfully so. Second was the controlled and inconsistent access to third-party movements, with access to traditional movements now being controlled by a few players such as Etta and Valjou being operated by the Swatch Group. This led to difficulties in sustained manufacturing once production for a brand reached a certain threshold, as at any moment access to these movements could be cut off by these suppliers. There were, of course, new alternatives that would pop up and gain market share as a result of this, but the lack of being able to control all aspects of production hurt certain mid-market brands. And finally, you have savvier consumers thanks to the internet. With the rise of watch forums and being able to find answers through a quick Google or YouTube search, consumers were able to collectively share knowledge with one another to better understand what was being delivered with products. Once this all came into effect, rolling out in-house movements for some brands was easier than others, as those in the higher segments that specialized in their movement production could simply just start positioning their watches with this term and consumers now would understand what it really meant. And let's be honest, when a manufacturer is able Able to develop their own movements within their facility, that should be applauded as the dollar amount required as well as the risks associated with producing a new movement are substantial. Yet where things get a bit dicey is with the many gray areas surrounding in-house movements, as what someone will constitute as in-house will change depending on who you ask. Let's discuss this basic concept first. Watch movement parts are not all created by the manufacturers assembling them in the vast majority of cases. This is a gray area, but one that is not an issue to me at all, as nearly every product, including the device you're watching me on right now, utilizes parts from specialists in order to create the end result. In watches, the most common components of a movement that are going to be sourced from specialists are the smaller elements like hairsprings, pallet forks, and parts of the balance assembly. Many brands are transparent about this and others just see this as an unwritten rule to be expected. And again, I see no issue with this, despite this maybe being news to some enthusiasts out there. But one of the bigger areas of conflict are when brands own a third party manufacturing arm and how that has bearing on the classification of in-house or not. This is very prevalent in watches at almost every price segment, with the Swatch Group owning Etta, Richemont operating Val Florier, Tudor and Chanel having an investment stake in Canisi, Citizen Group owning Miota, or smaller brands like Christopher Ward acquiring a movement manufacturer. These examples are just scratching the surface here. This all just poses the question though, if a brand makes part or the entire movement in a manufacturer they do indeed own, but are also producing movements for other brands in that same facility, is that still classified as in-house? Or another question, does the brand need to own it outright or can it be shared by a parent organization and just have the same effect? Another point in the conversation is modified versus truly in-house. 
So let's point out the silly trick when brands come up with their own naming conventions for movement when they are just replacing the rotor. Of course, this is a stretch to say the least. And although brands are not explicitly saying that these are in-house movements, this is misleading and I hope brands move away from this more in the future. When it comes to highly modified movements or proprietary movements from the likes of Longines, I see this as much more fair play, as there are notable changes and improvements being made while also being proprietary movements exclusive for the brand and are not being positioned as in-house. But where this elevates to is when brands market products as in-house despite using existing architecture. For example, the main plate from a Valju 7750 and reworking the bridges to appear like an entirely inventive movement from the display case back. So unless you are disassembling the movement or are a watchmaker, you wouldn't know at all. One of the infamous examples of this was an issue tag Hoyer ran into in 2010 when they positioned their 1887 caliber as in-house, despite it being difficult to distinguish between a Seiko Instruments movement. Another example are just general inconsistencies that I think many people bring up when looking at Richemont Group brands. Tag clearly learned from the misstep, but this is still a pervasive idea in watches given the weight many consumers hold and being able to classify something as in-house. Brands are going to respond to that accordingly and offer something that is going to meet that demand. Another circumstance that is less controversial is when a brand uses an abosh or third-party movement for inspiration and decides to recreate it within their facility. A common example of this that I mention frequently is with Nomos's entry-level caliber, the Alpha Manual. For around a decade, Nomos used the Pazoo 7001 or Eta 7001, a thin manual caliber commonly found in thin dress watches. But as access to these watch movements became volatile, they opted to start making a similar structured movement within their facility. This is what eventually led to the Alpha Manual, a movement that Nomos makes within their manufacturer and resembles the Pazoo 7001 strongly, being upgraded with Nomos's finishing techniques and getting an added hacking function. And although perhaps not as sophisticated as the DUW family that utilizes their proprietary escapement, this is a movement that is being made within their facility and probably can be classified as in-house depending on who you ask. Nomos's backstory is a bit more transparent, and I don't think this is an insidious practice by any means, but still, it does bring a lot into question about what is actually happening in the industry in regards to in-house. All of these gray areas are brought up just to prove the point. Judging what constitutes as in-house versus not is far from simple. So instead, let's shift into the real objective truths, analyzing the upsides and downsides of in-house movements. There is no question, in-house movements do have their benefits in many instances. The least practical yet still legitimate being the exclusive product and generally higher attention to the craft that comes with them. This is certainly a more romantic idea, but it is undoubtedly a huge draw for many consumers. And as brands begin to align further with artistry and craftsmanship as watches continue to mean something different for consumers, this will become increasingly pertinent. Secondly, they typically exhibit higher finishing techniques. When a brand places an order and receives an abosh movement, they usually come fully assembled. As a result, brands are usually not going to disassemble to refinish all the components, instead opting for the factory finishing and maybe an upgrade to the rotor. In the case of in-house calibers, assembly is being done at every single stage, which leads to finishing of individual components and usually exhibits a higher end technique. But the most important upside of in-house movements is the up performance. The most common Common improvements to movements of the in-house variety are mostly done with the power reserve, added professional spec against magnetism and shock, and regulation with stated accuracy standards. Also, by taking things within their control, manufacturers also can make architectural changes that can impact a watch's stature. This is probably best represented when it comes to chronograph movements, given the near eight millimeters thick that comes with value calibers, and ultimately leads to watches that are fully cased up 14 millimeters or more in thickness. Contrasting this with something like the El Primero that typically finds itself in watches that are on 12 millimeters thick, it offers some wearability upsides in addition to the inherent mechanical advantages. But given the romantic view in which many enthusiasts examine in-house movements, the upsides are sometimes all consumers care about. But the reality is, in-house movements are not infallible creations, nor are they always better than third-party counterparts. Falling in line with some of our earlier points, in-house calibers are seen as more premium in the eyes of consumers, and in most instances, you pay for it, given the added time for production and exclusivity of the movement within. But secondly, and most importantly, in-house movements exclusivity at times and added complexity lead to the number one factor going against them, 
difficulty of servicing. This manifests itself in two ways. One with the price tag associated with servicing, and two, the access to parts and just who can exactly work on the watches. This helps make a strong case for Eta, Salita, and Valju calibers, as when buying a watch with these movements inside, you know any watchmaker is going to be able to service them. With an in-house movement, the opposite is true, as independent jewelers might not have access to the necessary parts, or in other instances, are not capable of actually servicing the watch and will require you to send it to another location location domestically or internationally. This very fact is why I stand up for the third party movements consistently. So please take your Edda slander elsewhere. Now, again, I understand why in-house movements are popular. I understand why people value them and look to them as a key attribute for a watch that they're looking to buy next. It certainly does add a sense of prestige to a brand when you're looking in the direction to buy. But this term in house is not a perfect one. And it has kind of become a game of semantics for many watch brands that just can lead to a lot of gray areas where we're dealing with the world of transparency. And although an in-house movement is impressive, just understand the full context and ask if it's bringing forth added benefit, because that's really the most important thing at the end of the day. Whether it's with the decoration, you value that, you love the power reserve that comes with that in-house movement. Maybe you're a stickler for internal accuracy standards and this watch movement will come along with that. Try to factor all these things together look at the price and just make the best decision for you. Also, don't overlook third-party movements, whether you're talking about a true just third-party movement powering your watch or just something that is modified. I think a lot of people just unrightfully put down modified movements as a insult rather than something that maybe is actually in reality a better end product and will give you a lot more peace of mind. I would say make the logical decision, but logic and luxury rarely intersect. But all right guys, I know this is a controversial topic. I was actually kind of a little hesitant to talk about it, but I think this is a topic that needs to be discussed a little bit more in the world of watches. I think people are very quick to just discuss in-house is always better, maybe put down ETA movements and things of that sort when they start getting to like $4,000 and it's just trash and always trash. I just think that's a really myopic way of looking at this subject matter. And again, I'm not a watchmaker, uh, so I can't provide the most in detail type of view of this world. Uh, but these are just things that I am aware of, I know, and I've come into contact with. Uh, but I'd love to see comments down below. If you did enjoy this video, you found it helpful, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. Also, in addition to that, what is your take on in-house movements uh, versus Adam movements, um, other third-party calibers? I'd love to see comments down below and you know just get a discussion going on down there with other people. Also, check out teddybaldnesser.com, full authorized dealer of over 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, support, also offer a full factory warranty for all the products that we carry. So if something goes wrong, you're completely covered. And when talking about the subject of in-house movements and things that go wrong and service costs that can get into the thousands, you don't want to have that on your head. In addition to that, nine out of every $10 we generate goes right back to the content that we're creating here, helping to foster up a new generation of watch enthusiasts in the process. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.